This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope ruled the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today, they offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jörg 66 We have today the 20th of August 2015 and I welcome you all to a new broadcast on Hour of the Truth. As usual, my friend and brother in Christ over there in Oregon on the United States West Coast, uh, Walt Stickel is with me and he will join us later in our conversation. But before we go into the things that we announced that we will talk about today, which is, uh, I think we kept it for the second hour today, is um, the new chapter 12 of uh, the book of the Global Vatican Jesuit Conspiracy, the booklet that Walt put together, The Jesuits Today. We will use the first hour to uh, discuss some current issues. And one of these current issues, that's something that came up to me in the latest days while I was watching a lot of Walter Fight videos, uh, most and for all um, the Total Onslaught series, uh, to again go through all the things um, that the Reformation gave us. And by that I was thinking about some people who said that, um, you know, I, I, I get some comments about um, the SDA church, sometimes even if I am SDA, so I can tell you right now, I never in my whole life was any part of any congregation. I, I never was a member of any church, uh, whether they're in Germany where I was, and surely not here in Belgium where I'm living right now. So I'm not affiliated to any church, but what came to me was a little bit... You know, I had this wondering when, when watching the Walter Fight videos. What surprises me all the time again is that Walter Fight went through the effort to make three videos about the corrupted Bibles. The first he did was called Battle of the Bibles, and the second was called Changing the Words, where he explicitly explains what are the differences between the King James Version Bible that 
I and Walt, we take as our authority, because that's the only uncorrupted word of God as we understand it in the English language today. And what's the difference with that Bible to all the other Bibles? How they left out whole verses and, 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 change, and changing the words in there, taking away the deity of Jesus Christ and all that stuff. And when you watch Walter Fight videos, or when I watch them, I always was surprised when all of a sudden uh, he quoted from the NIV and from other Bibles, even though that he made this video on the King James. And then I said, yeah, okay, but he's working for, five, for a 501c3 organization called Amazing Discoveries, and that's a 501c3 organization. And I think that people are not very much aware of what all these things imply. So even though I cannot find any fault in the teachings of Walter Fried when he discusses, uh, for example, or reveals to what the Revelation, the book of Revelation means to all of us, I haven't found any fault in there. I always see that a lot of people say, yeah, well, Walter Fight, that's SDA, and SDA is a corrupt church, and it was founded by Jesuits, and it was founded by this, and, 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 and uh, it's founded by Masons, and Ellen G. White was not a prophetess. You know, I, I absolutely agree on that. Ellen G. White was not a prophetess, at least not in my eyes. And all, uh, a lot of her writings have been corrupted, probably, and I always wondered myself how in that time that she lived, she could write that many books that she did and that big books that she wrote. So I don't know if that's all really coming from her. And I never went into uh, reading her books. I never even read The Great Controversy or some other books that she wrote. And I'm not interested in reading these also. But what I learned by going through, especially the first few chapters of Revelation, uh, when Walter Feit <clears throat> read them, or I, I watched something uh, of, of the use at the time, who also comes from the SDA church, is that we have to understand that even if the SDA, SDA church was founded by Freemasons, who are, uh, the, who are under the control, of course, of um, the Black Pope, we are, uh, through the Jesuit order, that even though that there comes a lot of interesting views on the Bible out of there, and this is, of course, the enemy of God, that how God uses even the enemy to tell us the truth. And now people fix often on the Seventh-day Adventist church, but I think, and this is something we all should consider in our views that the Reformation and especially Luther would not have been possible without the Roman Catholic Church and their system because all the reformers that we know they all came out of one church and that is the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church ruled from 538 AD on the whole world yeah. And by saying that, I mean there was no other church in the world that did any significant writings or uh, any significant revelations on Bibles or whatever because the Bible was forbidden to possess. It was forbidden to read the Bible and the Bible was not even accessible in the people's own language. People like <clears throat> Tyndale, who translated the Bible then for a big part, and uh, under Henry VIII in England, there came out the English Bible a year after that he was burned on the stake. That came out, and at the same time, Luther translated the Bible into German, and that started a fire, a real fire in Europe. And not only the people ran away from the Roman Catholic Church, but also the kings, they all of a sudden understood that they had absolutely no power as long only the power the Pope gave to them. And that led to a kind of a revolution, let's call it that way, and they went away from the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church all of a sudden had a big problem, and not only a money problem, because all the revenues didn't come in anymore, but also, of course, 
a problem with her authority. And we have to consider that all the reformators that we know, they all came out of the, at that time, only existing church in the world, the Roman Catholic Church. And we know, as Protestants, that the Roman Catholic Church is our enemy, and Jesus' enemy, and by that, God's enemy. But, that, but does that take anything away of the righteous teachings the Reformers did? Well, you have to ask that for yourself. I came to the conclusion, no. Because if I would deny the Reformation and what it did for the whole world in that time, then I would deny everything that the Reformation accomplished. God walks in mysterious ways, and God uses the enemy to achieve his goals. And another very interesting example for that is the whole planning that the Jesuits did to overthrow the Pope in 1798, which led to the wound, as predicted in Revelation 13, that would be afflicted to the beast, the deadly wound, as they call it. It was Napoleon's General Berthier who was sent into Rome to capture the Pope and put him to prison. What he did, this was written in the Bible hundreds and hundreds of years before. So God even uses the enemy to achieve his goals. And it's the same thing with the SDA Church. So that, of course, today and this time, you don't have to be a part of the SDA Church anymore. It's the same that you shouldn't be a member of the Lutheran Church anymore. Because you understand that, uh, I think at least you understand that, because in the first broadcast we did on Hour of the Truth, we went through the Catholic Lutheran Accord from 1999, where the Lutheran Worldwide Confederation signed a paper of agreement <clears throat> uh, called um, the document on the just uh, on, on the uh, on, on the justification. I, I don't get that whole name here anymore, so I'm slaughtering it a little bit. Excuse me for that. But look the broadcast up. Um, and uh, at that time, the Lutheran Church came back under the wings of Rome. And a few years later, in 2004, the Methodists came under the wings of Rome by agreeing to the same uh, to the same paper. So even though these churches today are apostate again, in the beginning, when they came out of the Roman Catholic Church, they were absolutely opposed to the Roman Catholic Church. So everything that we achieved through the Reformation, actually we have to thank the people who came out of the church. Just think of, for example, Richard Bennett, who put that paper together on the Catholic Lutheran Accord of 1999 that we read in the first four parts of uh, Hour of the Truth when we started this broadcast, he also came out of the Roman Catholic Church. The youth came out of the, of, 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 uh, of the SDA Church in the same way. And he is today still teaching the three angels message with an emphasis on the third angel, which is now taught by the, taught by the SDA today anymore. But at that time, and the use still does it today. He's one of the few people that I know who really kept to the word of God, always using the 1611 King James Bible in his lectures, and he analyzes it from that standpoint. So I don't think that because today this church has been so infiltrated and obviously being met by Jesuits, certainly in their general congregation, that therefore we should throw out all the teachings they did. You know, Luther wasn't perfect. Luther did a lot of mistakes and didn't go all the way. And we did a broadcast on that, on uh, Nothing But The Truth, I think it was already a time ago, uh, how um, uh, we asked the question, why didn't the reformers go all the way? And when you look into the Council of Trent, which was parted in three different sessions, and in the middle session even the Protestants were invited to be a part of that, in that middle session, uh, we mentioned in that broadcast, we have that very significant statement the Archbishop of Reggio did at that time, by saying 
the Protestants say they use sola scriptura, but on the other hand, they keep on to the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church by keeping the Sunday as their Sabbath instead of the seventh-day Sabbath as, as it is written in the Bible. There was one of Luther's fault, and that's the same fault a lot of other <clears throat> um, reform, reformers did, because not all the reformed churches in that time kept the Sabbath holy. So it was always a part of the, of the truth that went out. Luther had a part, Huss had a part, um, Knox had a part, and from all these people came different denominations. Um, they, they founded the Methodist Church, they founded the Baptist Church, and they always teach a part of the truth, but never the whole truth. And that's the same with the SDA. Uh, the, same, <clears throat> the same also. And the SDA makes it, of course, her very big standpoint of keeping the Sabbath. If, if that is something that you agree on or don't agree on, that is something that you have to see with your personal relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, whether you agree on that or you don't agree on that. But only because they do that and they put the emphasis on that and they teach the three angels' message, where very important is the third angels' message, being to explain that how the Roman Catholic Church is, um, uh, is, is, is the final beast, is the Antichrist, as we always say in all, in all our broadcasts, I don't throw that out just because it comes from the SDA church. You have to pick the things that are true in there, and then you have to weigh it against the Bible. And when God gives us the chance to listen to people coming from the SDA or coming from the Baptists or coming from the Methodists or coming from any other denomination, whatever, or the Lutherans, whatever, you always have to, put the, to pick the truth out of there to get the whole picture. And I don't understand why people today always bashing on the SDA because of Jesuit and everything. I, I understand that. But go a little bit back in time and see how many people... I mean, the SDA was, was formed about 1844. Think about how many times, how many people, because of the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, got their eyes opened and found Jesus Christ the way it was meant to be. How many people, because of the SDA church, even left the Roman Catholic Church and got their eyes opened and got saved? And I do not <clears throat> dismiss this fact. And for that, I really can tell you I'm not, I'm really not an SDA basher or whatever, even though I will not give anyone any advice to go to any organized church today to any organized denomination because today they are all controlled and surely when we go and see about uh, the United States of America the United States of America plays a very very important role in the end times that's why the United States of America is also mentioned in Revelation 13 not many countries were mentioned in Revelation 13 but of course America the beast that comes out of the earth is mentioned there. This is the last Protestant stronghold we have all over the world. And this lamb has now started to talk like a dragon, as Revelation 13 always said. Uh, the beast that comes out of the earth has two horns like a lamb, but speaks as a dragon. And another example of that that the America, that uh, the United States will speak as a dragon. Another example you will make in e a little more than a month, when on the 23rd of September, the Pope comes over there and speaks to the Congress, to a joint session of Congress and Senate over there in the United States of America, speaks to the legislative. The Antichrist comes and speaks to the legislative, something that would have been impossible 50 years ago, something that would have been impossible more than 100 years ago anyway. Now, today, it is possible. And why? Because we have had, in the meantime, things like Vatican II between 1962 and 1965 and the whole ecumenical movement. And also, do not forget, how did all the churches in the United States of America become corrupt in the meantime? Well, for that, I have looked up um, a, an email that I get regularly from a brother, uh, in, I think, Australia. Yes, his name is Bruce Telfer. 
And he sends out an email called Signs of the Times. And the latest one that I got some, I don't know, uh, two weeks ago is called Church and State and the IRS. And I'm going to read a little bit of that. And in that way, you will probably even more get a bigger picture of that, what I always said before. So I'm going to quote a little bit from that email that he sent to me. And I will not always say which quote it is. If you want to ask, if you want to know that, I can send it to you. It's no problem. But for example, from Nolo's Plain English Law Dictionary, we get 501c3 and the definition of that, meaning, quote, refers to an organization that has applied for and obtained tax exempt status from the IRS, which is the U.S. taxation agency, under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, unquote. And the next quote goes, I am not the only IRS employee who wondered why churches go to the government and seek permission to be exempt from a tax they didn't owe to begin with and to seek a tax-deductible status that they've always had anyway. Many of us have marveled at how church leaders want to be regulated and controlled by an agency of government that most mean to be uh, that most Americans have prayed would just get out of their lives. Churches are in an amazingly unique position, but they don't seem to know or appreciate the implications of what would it mean to be free of government control. This comes from Steve Nestor, and he is an IRS senior officer. And I can give you the quote where it's uh, written in if you ask me to, no problem. Another quote comes from Melvin Blow, he is an IRS agent, and he was testifying under oath in federal court, Tampa, Florida, January 24, 2001. The quote is, once a church obtains the status of 501c3 under the IRC, they are trapped. The only way to be removed from a 501c3 status is if the IRS chooses to remove the exemption. So if you dissolve the corporation and continue as an uh, arm as ABC Church, an unincorporated church, you're still trapped in their web and under their control. End quote. And there's one coming from Michael Chitwood. And if you do not know him, he is from Chitwood and Chitwood. That is the most prominent certified public accountant firm in America, which specializes in advising churches on IRS compliance. And he said, quote, Pastor, if you don't get your house in order, get ready. You are going to have a jail ministry, i.e., you will go to jail. Pastors needs, need to be ordained by God and the IRS, unquote. And Barbara Kite, she's a lawyer in Biblical Law Center, said, quote, First, we need to acknowledge that many pastors are in denial about the truth of the 501c3 corporation, unquote. The recent change in U.S. law to allow homosexual marriage is almost certainly going to have dire consequences for the churches of America. Already, business owned and operated by Christians have been dramatically impacted as a result of the law change. Even before the Supreme Court ruling in 2015, I think it was in June, a cake company in Oregon in 2013 was fined a 135,000 Federal Reserve, Reserve notes under the state's discriminatory laws for refusing to bake a wedding cake for a lesbian couple. In another case, a gay man is suing two Bible printing companies because Bibles contain offensive homosexual language which violates his constitutional rights and causes him emotional stress. Such cases are becoming commonplace. There is a militant element in the gay community that are actively seeking revenge on Christianity for their perceived persecution by Christians. Time magazine commenting on the Supreme Court decision says that, quote, the ground under our feet has shifted tectonically, unquote. This is from Time, June 26. 2015. The same article goes on to say that the court decision, quote, will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to ascend to the new orthodoxy, unquote, and will be used to oppress the faithful, quote, by those 
who are determined to stamp out every vestige of dissent, and that, quote, Orthodox Christians must understand that things are going to get much more difficult for us. We are going to have to learn how to live as exiles in our own country, unquote. So, now that gay marriage or sodomite marriage is legally allowed throughout the entire nation, what is going to happen when a church refuses to marry a gay couple? To understand the consequences of such a refusal, we need to understand the consequences of something else. The consequences of being a 501c3 incorporated church registered with the government in America. The simplest way for churches to be approved for tax-free status from the IRS is to be legally incorporated, meaning become a corporation. And as a result, about 90% of churches in America are 501c3 corporations registered with the government. And again, Barbara Kite of Biblical Law Center explains what it means to be a corporation registered with the government. Quote, okay, pastors, evangelists, missionaries, deacons, trustees, elders, listen up. Let's stop all the hocus pocus, the illusions, the scams, the fairy tales, and the outright lies regarding what the 501c3 incorporated church is and is not. For a change, let's deal with facts. For those of you who don't understand facts in the legal arena, facts are used and are supported by documented evidence, which would be admissible in a legitimate court of law. Facts are not hyperbole, i.e. exaggeration. And these are the facts, according to Barbara Kite, as what to a 501c3 church corporation is lawful state definition, is by lawful state definition. First, the creator of a corporation is a state. The state is the sole authority and sovereign head of the corporation. The corporation is subject to the laws of the state which limits its powers. The corporation has no constitutionally protected rights. The corporation is an artificial person. The corporation submits to a state charter declaring it is a creature of the state. The corporation is created for the benefit of the public. The corporation is a state franchise. And the corporation is a privilege granted by the state. Just to make it clear, Barbara Kite makes the following disturbingly personal. The creator of your church is the state. The state is the sole authority and sovereign head over your church. Your church is subject to the laws of the state which limits its powers. Your church has no constitutionally protected rights. Your church is an artificial person. Your church submits to a state charter declaring it is a creature of the state. Your church is created for the benefit of the public, not the membership. Your church is a franchise, meaning an agent of the state, and your church is a privilege granted by the state which privilege can be taken away by an act of state at any time. Since the inception of the 501c3 incorporated church beginning 1954, and we will deal later with that 1954, that was Lyndon B. Johnson who started this, the churches of America have had a tense relationship with the government, especially with the IRS, and the government has shown considerably leniency with churches that have broken the rules, probably because the government was not ready to challenge the churches, which would clearly reveal the legal bind the churches are in. But the recent law change allowing gay marriage is a game changer. There are all sorts of state and federal anti-discriminatory laws that immediately come to effect with the homosexual law change. One 501c3 rule which will be used against the churches is the following, quote, the organization's purpose and activities may not be illegal or violate fundamental public policy, unquote. This comes from the IRS publication, Tax Guide for Churches and Religious Organizations, section Jeopardizing Tax Accept Status, page 5, and I can give you the internet link to the PDF. This regulation is a dagger aimed at the heart of the churches. Sodomy, 
gay marriage is now legal. If the churches oppose it, they will be discriminating and acting illegally, and this makes them subject to government censure. Even more alarming is the phrase, quote, or violate public policy, unquote, which, mean, which means that the churches are obliged to accept without protesting whatever government policy might be or will be, which now includes gay marriage, sodomy. The question is, will the churches be able to survive the assault that is certainly coming their way over this issue, especially as the U.S. and the world at large is becoming increasingly anti-Christian? One church in particular, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is going to be especially impacted. For over 150 years, the SDA Church has been preaching that there will eventually be a national Sunday law legislated in the United States, just like the original one enacted by the first Christian Roman Emperor Constantine in 321, I remind you. When the Sunday law becomes a reality, when it becomes official government policy, how will the SDA Church react? Will it accept the government decree and obey its 501c3 obligations, or will it resist? What does resisting mean? It means that if a church wants to escape the embrace of the state and get out of the 501c3 corporate contract, it will have to surrender most or even all of its assets to the state, because the state considers the assets were procured in large part by taxpayers' money. This has been the experience already of churches that have tried to severe the 501c3 incorporated connection. Such a severe outcome is in accordance with being a registered 501c3 cooperation, but usually not understood when entered into. In other words, the church that tries to escape risks its very, ex uh, risks its very existence it could lose its organizational structure entirely and it could be reduced to individual members only. And I'll follow a few notes that I also want to take you into consideration after saying this. The first note reads as follows. The 501c3 situation is an issue peculiar to America. However, many other nations have something similar whereby their governments give churches and charities tax-free status. The question is, what conditions are imposed on these churches when they enter into these contracts? Most likely, the conditions will be similar to the ones in America. It could be time to read the fine print. And another note states, churches in America becoming 501c3 registered cooper corporations is a relatively new phenomenon. It was an initiative started by Senator Lyndon Johnson, who became later president in 1954. His aim was to muzzle the churches and prevent them from using the pulpit for political purposes. This was when the civil rights issues, uh, issue was becoming prominent, which saw the rise of the fiery preacher Martin Luther King. Now that most churches in America are neutered, by becoming 501c3 corporations, it is unlikely that there will ever be another Martin Luther King in the United States of America. And we go on to read that according to the IRS code, paragraph 508c1a, the churches of America are automatically tax exempt. In fact, they always have been, going back to the American colonial times when churches came under the English common law known as the law of charities. This tax-free status was further enshrined in the new American Republic with the protection offered under the first amendment to the Constitution. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Unquote. So, this was something that I really had to get off my heart to all and for once make you common known with the IRS 501c3 Texas stamp data, all the American churches use today, and what these imply, 
And also, the thing that I said before, don't throw out a church that is apostate now for the right teachings they did in the past. Without the SDA church, without the Lutheran church, without Luther and with all, all the reformers, we would today still be living in the black age, in the dark age. And probably we won't be even living anymore. They would have gotten us already. But by this, sorry, Walt, I took a half an hour and I didn't leave you that much time in the first, play, in the first part. But I really had to get that off my heart. And um, now I want to invite you to our broadcast and share the things that you have brought to the table or even make a little comment on what I've said here. So, Walt, um, thanks for your patience and welcome to the broadcast. Uh, uh, good evening, Belgium. Can you hear me good? Very well. Okay. Well, listen, uh, every, I enjoyed listening because what you were saying there is plays right into actually what I wanted to comment today on. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, uh, is the SDA. I myself, I've been accused of being uh, an SDA. <clears throat> but when you look at history and you look at Luther like and S the SDA, the SDA was almost like a second uh, reformation in uh, because you see as 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 futurism as futurism started to grow and that and it, that's when it started to grow is about the same time that the seventh day adventist church was was formed you, you know, is is the the SDA and I'm talking about the old SDA I am not talking about the new the new SDA everybody knows have been infiltrated and they're even going back to Sunday uh, uh, and uh, and the SDA is the second largest denomination but what I find uh, so 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 interesting is in our times that we live in the times that we live in with the Pope coming to visit here on, I believe some say the 23rd, I think it's the 24th now, the 24th of September. And I came across an article, I came across an article called The Crisis of Our Time by John W. Robbins. John W. Robbins has read, wrote several books and one of them was the Ecclesiastical Megalomania. And uh, John W. Robbins passed away in 2008. But uh, I want to write a little article, a reader, a little, I'm not going to read the whole article, but he had this, uh, he, wrote the, he, he wrote the preface for Papal Power by Henry T. Hudson. And um, in the back of Henry T. Uh, T. Hudson's book, Papal Power, he's got a little article called The Crisis of Our Time. And I'm going to... I, I, now, I'll have enough time here to, to get the point across what I want to talk about here, though. Let uh, me start. Well, we, have, we have the time. Sorry to interrupt you. We have the time. If you want to read the whole page. No, you, no, uh, no, 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 no. We're, I'm going to. I'm, no, I'll just fit it into uh, mm. to the half hour. But, uh, but this, the, the, the main meat of this is at the start of it. And you can actually click on the link that's in the, in the box there, and you can uh, uh, read the whole article. Uh, he starts off with, historians have christened the 13th century of the age of faith and termed the 18th century the age of reason. And that was the 1776 and beginning of America. The 20th century was called many things, the atomic age, the age of inflation, the age of the tyrant, the age of Aquarius. But the modern age deserves one more name than the others. It's the age of irrationalism. Contemporary intellectuals are anti-intellectual. Contemporary philosophers are anti-philosophy. Contemporary theologians are anti-theologian. In past centuries, secular philosophers have generally believed that knowledge is possible to man. Consequently, they exp expended a great deal of thought and effort to try to justify their, their claims to know. In the 20th century, however, the optimism of the secular philosophers all but disappeared. They did. They disappeared of knowing. Like the they despaired. Like, say that again. Sorry, they they despaired of knowing. They, yeah, they despaired of knowing. Like the secular secular counterparts, the great theologians and doctors of the church taught that 
Knowledge is possible to man, yet the theologians of the 20th century repudiated that belief. They also despaired of knowledge. The radical skepticism has penetrated our entire culture, from television to music to literature. And what is not being talked about in this article and what, what has penetrated all our culture and our television and our music and our literature is Jesuitism, the Jesuits. The Christian at the beginning of the 21st century is confronted with an overwhelming cultured conscience, sometimes stated explicitly, but most often implicitly. Man does not and cannot know anything truly. You know, we've all heard there isn't a right or there isn't a wrong. What does, what does this have to do with Christianity? Simply this. If man can't know nothing, truly, man can truly know nothing. We cannot know that the Bible is the word of God and that Christ died for his people or that Christ is alive today at the right hand of the Father unless knowledge is possible. Christianity is nonsensi- nonsensical for it claims to be knowledge. What is at stake at the existence, what is at stake at the beginning of the 21st century is not simply a single doctrine such as the virgin birth or the existence of hell, as, in, as important as these doc, those doctrines may, may be, but the whole of Christianity itself. If knowledge is not possible to man, it is worse than silly to argue points of doctrine is insane. The irrationalism of the present age is so thorough and persuasive that even the remnant, the segment of the professing church that remains faithful, has accepted much of it, frequently without even being aware of what he is accepting. In, In some religious circles, this irrationalism has become synonymous with piety and humility, and those who impose it are denouncing as rationalist, as though to be logically were a sin. Our contemporary anti-theologians make a contradiction and call it mystery. The faithful ask for truth and are given a paradox, which means a a contradiction. If any resists swallowing the absurdities of the anti-theologians who teach the seminaries, or have graduated from the seminaries, they are frequently marked as heretics or schismatics who seek to act independently of God. And we've all been, we've all been faced with this. When you question, when you go to a church, you're not there to question. You're there to absorb, like a sponge. You check your brain and your Bible at the door. Now, what I wanted to bring out in this article is after I read this, I've been digesting this for the last week. And I got up this morning, and, and we, when we, I'm going to go start back at the start of this article. When, they use, when the author uses irrationalism, now that is the proper word for this article, not to take away from the article, because the, the author of this article passed away in 2008. And he didn't know that we're going to have a Jesuit coming to speak to a joint session of Congress. Now, now, I'm going to reread this, this top. top. The, The 20th century was called many things, the atomic age, the age of inflation, the age of the tyrant, the age of Aquarius. But the modern age deserves one more, one name more than the others, the age of Roman Catholicism. Replace irrationalism with Roman Catholicism. <clears throat> and and, it, and it, then when you go to, I'm going to go down to the fourth paragraph. It says, the irrationalism, now let's read it using Roman Catholicism. The Roman, Catholic, Ro, Roman Catholicism of the present age is so thoroughgoing and persuasive that even the remnant, even the remnant, The segment of the professing church that remains faithful has accepted much of it, frequently without even being aware of what it is accepting. In some religious circles, 
this Roman Catholicism has become somewhat synonymous with piety and humility, and those who oppose it are announced as rationalists. Now, this is exactly what is going on. And now, the fifth paragraph down here, it, it continues. I haven't read this part, but I'm going to use the word instead of, instead of irrationalism, I'm going to use Roman Catholicism. There is no greater threat facing the true Church of Christ at the moment than the Roman than Roman Catholicism that now controls our entire culture. I'm speaking from America. It controls every single facet of our government. Totalitarianism, which is Roman, Roman it could be, I could replace totalitarianism with Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is guilty of hundreds of millions of murders, including three, three those of millions of Christians. It is to be feared, but not nearly so much as the idea that we are, we are not and cannot know the literal truth. He, he, he deism, the popular philosophy of America, but I don't know what that, did I pronounce that right? Hedonism. Hedonism, the popular philosophy of America, is not to be feared so much as the belief that logic, that mere human logic to use, to use the irrational, and now I'm going to replace this with, with Roman Catholic, to use Roman Catholic's own phrase is futile. The attacks on truth, on knowledge, on propositional revelation, on the in, in, intellect, on words, and on logic are renewed daily. But I'm going to stop right there for, this, for the pause in the middle of the, our broadcast. But this article can be written in its, can be read in its entirety on that link there. And I think it's uh, very uh, prominent today uh, that, uh, and it fits right in with what uh, York was talking about the first uh, 25 minutes. So it's back to you, York. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I think that is a very interesting article. And that is, of course, the reason why you put that on your website, Grand Design Exposed. I had some time to get the things off my heart that I wanted to tell you. And Walt had also some things uh, to reveal to you by reading the part of the crisis of our time. And uh, we reserve the second part of our broadcast today to uh, continue the reading of the book, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, the booklet that Walt put together, and that if you want to have it, even printed as a book, you just send him an email and he will gladly send you a free book wherever you are, and also send you the instructions how you can print that book for yourself by taking the PDF file down to your printer on a USB stick and get it bound as a book to get this word out. This booklet, The Jesuit Vatican Global Conspiracy from Walt, has the word Jesuit about 221 times mentioned in it, if I'm remembering that right, Walt? Yes, it is. And it's it probably, is? since I put the other chapter in there, it's probably more like 230. It's probably a little bit more, yes. But this chapter 12, uh, can you give us a little bit uh, background before I start reading where this comes from? This is called The Jesuits Today, um, and that comes from uh, Michael de Semlian, who you also spoke about in our last broadcast, who wrote a book together with some other person, and that book was called All Roads Lead to Rome, right? Yes. How did you how did you find that? How did you get that? And um, it's it's very interesting, of course, that you then just took this one chapter out and put it in the book. And I'm very keen on reading this uh, as soon as you have done with your explanation. But I want to know a little bit background also for our listeners. That would be interesting how you got that, how you found that. Oh, well, a friend a friend bought the book, and uh, I I had never heard of uh, of the. I mean, I had never heard this author. And, uh, and I'll tell you, every chapter in this book, it, I mean, this author is uh, very gifted and can paint, paints a vivid picture of, uh, of, um, of Rome and Rome's influence in, our, in today. But, you know, I want to, just, just before you start this, I just want to, you know, one thing about Hour of the Truth and I noticed this in one thing that puts us off by ourselves is we're focused. Now, Romanism 
in the Reformation and what's happened the last 500 years has everything to do with what's happening. Romanism and the Reformation. If you go back and look at our, our broadcasts, it's all focused on Romanism and revealing Rome. And so as we start this broadcast, you know, this is what puts our of the truth, not that we have a curb on any truth, because most of our listeners are researchers themselves. But this is, this is what alternative media is not giving you. They're not focused. They're not focused. They're focused on some other event, all the little sideshows that, that are in between. But who is the puppeteer? Who is control, pulling the strings? And it's the Jesuits. Yeah, and to, under, to understand that, well, sorry to interrupt you, but, but to understand that you really have to know your Bible, then you know that in the end times there's only one kingdom that rules, and that is the Roman kingdom. When you read the prophecies of Daniel and his interpretation of the dream that he gave to Nebuchadnezzar at that time, I think that was in Daniel 2 or Daniel 3, if I'm not mistaken, where he saw the figure with a golden hat that was... Babylon and the silver shoulders that was Medo Persia and the belly of brass that was Greece and the two legs of iron that is the Roman Empire. These four are the empires that always ruled the world, the known world. And the last kingdom is Rome. It is not because in 476 pagan Rome fell into ten different kingdoms that it vanished it only put on another mask the mask of the Holy Roman Empire and all the early churches knew that there was one thing that held back the Antichrist and they all knew it was the Roman Caesars and I stumbled upon something very interesting a few days ago, and that is Tertullian. I don't know if anybody even knows Tertullian, but he is one of the early church writers. <clears throat> and I only have this article here in, uh, in Dutch, so I'm not going to read it. But he lived in the time between 160 and 230 after Christ. And he was a very important church father. And he knew, like all the other early church fathers knew, that there was something in the way of the Antichrist to come. The little horn coming out of the ten horns. And they all, the early Christians, all identified that what was in the way as the Roman Caesars. And from the moment the Roman Caesars fell, and that was the case in 538, and you don't have to believe me. Just read scripture and just read history or even go back to our broadcast that we did <clears throat> on characteristics of the Antichrist. That is all mentioned in there. All these early Christians knew that once the pagan Caesars went away, the Antichrist would rule and that is the basis also all the reformers took. They didn't come up with a new idea. They only put the existing ideas, the suppressed ideas, through the Dark Ages and brought them into light and brought them into the light to the people that the light of Jesus Christ shines again on this world. The Reformation was a movement to counter the Roman Catholic Church, and that was the counter set that God did. The Roman Catholic Church, man, came up with the Antichrist, and God came up with the Reformation. And he used people like Luther to come out of the Roman Catholic Church and to get the people the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and yes, you know, the, the, the number one book where knowledge starts is the Bible. 
Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction because they're their own gods. But this word knowledge is very, very important. It's in the Bible, if you do a word search on knowledge, it's in there 172 times. But, you know, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, that's 2 Timothy 3, 7. This is part of the, the, of the article, the crisis of our time. It gets into knowledge, you see, because not, history is knowledge, and knowledge is history. And if, and if you don't have the, God's word, the beginning of knowledge, you cannot cipher through it. You cannot, you're, you, 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 you cannot, in other words, there's man's way of doing things and there's God's way of doing things. Yeah, you got knowledge from the Bible and you got knowledge from men. And knowledge from men is called Gnosticism. And the knowledge of God is called the Bible. Yes. In Proverbs 2.10, when wisdom enters into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Proverbs 8.10 8.10 is receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. And see, this is, this is again, history is knowledge. And for the, I'm 71 years old and was taught no history. But I had, I, I, I was raised in a Lutheran church. I have never been an atheist. I have never been a God hater. So, 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 so when a, a, an atheist, the book is closed to an atheist. The whole book is closed because he's still searching for a god. The atheist is a god within himself, and so this is this is real, real important because we're this or this we're coming down to the time where, like John W. Robbins, when he wrote this article. You know, he he didn't know the Pope was coming in seven seven years to speak to a joint. This Bill Hughes calls the Pope's visit it's insanity. You know what the definition of insanity is? It's void Doing of the God. Same thing over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, but you become insane instantly. When you take God out of your life, an atheist is, it, it, it's irrational thinking. It's irrational that the Pope is coming to speak and everybody's hopping around saying nothing. Then, I mean, all these alternative medias and, and, and all of the, all of these ministers are out there that, are, that have graduates from seminaries and Bible colleges. They're not talking about who the Antichrist is. You see, you, you see at the beginning of this broadcast, when, when uh, York brought up the SDA, the reformers agreed on one thing. One thing, they understood their adversary. And then the nobility... We, last week we, wrote, we read a letter that was sent to the nobility in, in Martin Luther's time. It transformed countries because they realized they put their leg, pants on one leg at a time just like Caesar. And it, and it transformed capitalism. I'll, t I'll tell you what scared the scared the elite and the Jesuits is is the productivity of the Americans during World War II. I mean, as soon as the war was over, we were we were the attack. We've been attacked ever since May eighth, nineteen forty five, the end of the war. It's been on America because we had we had freedom. We had some freedom. Where do you think capitalism came from? It didn't come from Rome. You know, and so, you know, I, 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 as I see this, I, I, I see an urgency 
I mean, we've got a month before the Pope comes, okay? And in other words, you know, nothing. I, I mean, you know, you might, if, if, if uh, you know, um, if anybody's not just a little bit depressed, they're not alive right now. We're, we're, we're coming through a time in history in America where a, where a Jesuit Pope is coming to speak and where the, where the, the cha- house chaplain is a Jesuit. He's whispering in all of those legislators' ears. He's their confession man. Yes, it is time to know who the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is. And when it comes to the SDA, they are the ones that proclaim the Second Reformation here in this country because they are the ones that professed it. It wasn't the Mormons. It wasn't the Jehovah Witnesses. Now, I'm not an SDA. But you heard what York talked about earlier in this broadcast. I mean, that is what the Reformation, I mean, and, and, and it's a complete turnover. And that's why this chapter, chapter 12, the Jesuits today, is very important read. So in back to you, okay. York. Yeah, thank you, Walt. That was a very nice introduction. So for everybody who wants to follow, I pasted the link of the document in our chat box so you can read along. And it starts on page 81 of the PDF. All Roads Lead to Rome by the author Michael de Semlian. A vigilant Christian organization, which will be abbreviated CRIB or CRIP, the Catholic Research Information Bureau, sounded a strong and sober warning note. Quote, don't be deceived. The Roman church is like a chameleon, tolerant, friendly, highly moral and authoritative in Protestant England and America. But where there is a Roman Catholic majority, she is very different and no friend to freedom, always blending in with the landscape, but never quite what she seems, uh, never, never quit what she seems to be. Never quite what she seems to be, sorry. <laughs> Troubles with this word quite and quit. <laughs> End quote. H.G. Wells observed in his book, Crooks and Santa, that, quote, Roman Catholicism presents many faces to the world, but everywhere it is systematic in its fight against freedom, unquote. The Jesuits, who originally implemented the Counter-Reformation by decree of the Council of Trent, are seen as continuing to do so in the present century with increasing success. Once counselors to kings such as James II and Louis XIV, who held divine rights, as Jesuits very often masterminded the dramatic events of history by scheming and prompting backstage. Now they are making their comeback in positions of influence among our institutions. Many of them have been able to come out in the open, since in the current climate of spiritual indifference, they have little to hide. However, placed in in key positions in religious broadcasting and educational establishments, including Britain's top schools, even in evangelistic undertakings, they have been reinstated in a way that just decades ago would have seemed unthinkable. And I have to insert here a little bit that, of course, the author didn't know probably at that time, but think about now, now they have made a Jesuit of the fourth vow of the evil vow of induction of the Jesuits, a white pope. So who do you think rules the world? At the head of the Society of Jesus is the superior general, the supreme ruler of the Jesuits, often called the Black Pope. The full extent of his power and influence over the papacy can be known to very few, but it is more than possible that often it exceeds that of the Pope himself. Notorious in the past, expelled from every country in Europe and banned from residence in England until 1902, the Jesuits have often described, been described as the secret army of the papacy. The preface to Edmond Paris' book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, 
includes a warning to the church, which has been sounded many times in relation to the threat posed by the Counter-Reformation. Quote, The Order of the Society of Jesus was founded by Ignatius Loyola to secretly accomplish two major goals for the Roman Catholic institution. The first was to obtain universal political power. The second, to establish the universal church. The Reformation had seriously damaged the Roman system. The way forward, apart from the Inquisition, was by infiltration and penetration into every section of life, with the aim of enforcing the canons and doctrines and temporal power of the Pope. To that end, Jesuits went to work, secretly infiltrating all, all Protestant groups including families, places of work, hospitals, schools, colleges, etc. Today the Jesuits have almost completed that mission. The Bible puts local church government into the hands of a godly pastor, but the effect of Jesuit activity over the years has been to remove that power to the denominal headquarters, to temporalize the church and thus to push Protestant denominations into the arms of the Vatican, unquote, from Edmund Paris' Secret History of the Jesuits. And from Jude 4, we read, quote, For there are certain men, crept and unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, unquote. Now, Reverend James Atkin Wiley, a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic writer on Reformation, in the history of Protestantism, described the Jesuits thus, quote, There was no tongue they could not speak, and no creed they could not profess, and thus there was no people among whom they might not sojourn, and no church whose membership they might not enter, and whose functions they might not discharge they could execrate the Pope with the Lutheran and swear the solemn league with the Covenanter. The order of Jesus is never more formidable than when it appears to be least so. It is when Jesuits are stripped of all external means of doing harm that they devise the vastest schemes and execute them with the most daring courage. In the history of the Jesuits, end quote, in the History of the Jesuits, published in 1897, <clears throat> A. Nicolini revealed the four open classes of Jesuits and the fifth secret class who, well, that's interesting, I just downloaded the book of Nicolini a week ago. <laughs> interesting to read here of that. Quote, by the confession of Father Pellini, constitute the strength and power of the society. Nor does the agent of Rome and above all the Jesuit expound at once the whole system of his religion, such as it is. But with diabolical dexterity, he first insinuates himself into the confidence of the man he has marked as a proselyte, captivates his benevolence by all sorts of arts, and then, step by step, he leads him as a convert into the fold of the modern Babylon." Unquote. In 1551, secret instructions sent from the Council of Trent to the Jesuits in Paris were intercepted on the person of Thomas Heath, who was a Jesuit professing the highest style of Puritanism. These instructions set forth the most effective way of undermining and destroying the Church of England. Quote, Ye are not to preach all after one method, but observe the place wherein you come. If Lutherism is prevalent, then preach Calvinism. If Calvinism, then Lutherism. If in England, then either of them, or John Huss's opinions, Anabaptism, or any that are contrary to the Holy See or of St. Peter, by which our function will not be suspected, and yet you may still act on the interest of Mother Church, there being... <clears throat> There being, as the council are agreed on, no better way to demolish that church, the Church of England, of heresy, but by mixture of doctrines and by adding of ceremonies more than at present permitted, unquote. 
Das kommt von Albert Close, Rome's Fight for the British Throne, Wycliffe Press in London. And I also want to add, this is another example of the end justifies the means. And when you read the Jesuit Oath, or you watch our video that we did on some time ago on nothing but the truth, I was reading the Jesuit Oath and uh, explaining that with uh, Michael Adams at that time, you will get the jest. The end justifies the means. They come in all disguises, and there are numerous quotes from other writers that I could name right now who absolutely confirm that. But I continue reading on the bottom of page 83. According to the French writer Adolphe Michael, Voltaire estimated the number of books written about the Jesuits about the year, uh, uh, over the years to be around 6,000 at the end of the 18th century. In the 19th century, books and sermons countering the Jesuits and their activities were published in profusion. Nowadays, they are few and far between. It seems that innumerable, innumerable such works have gone out of print and disappeared from the bookshelves. In theological colleges and public libraries, it is now hard to find any history of the Jesuits beyond the beginning of the 17th century. Most books on the Counter-Reformation are written by Roman Catholics, many by the Jesuits themselves. Given that the Society of Jesus, today possibly more than ever, is the leading wing of the Roman Church, all of this, uh, all of this needs explanation and attention. Protestant watchmen believe that the Jesuits have accomplished a remarkable feat in a relative short time, span in ridding schools, universities, and theological colleges of almost all historical literature written from a Protestant viewpoint. The indoctrination and obedience. Education is the key to Jesuitism itself. Nicolini, uh, Nicolini says again, quote, The most striking characteristic of Jesuit education, as we have already frequently remarked, was and still is, that almost all the persons educated in their colleges consider themselves in a certain way attached to the order and to the end of their life's work and to their utmost for its aggrandizement. And this art of binding to their society all their disciples makes the Jesuits powerful and dangerous, especially in those countries where they are adverse to the government or to a class of citizens. We insist on this consideration, unquote. Examples of this binding or indoctrination are readily to be found in the spiritual exercises of founder Ignatius Loyola. In rules for thinking with the church, the instruction is, quote, always to be ready to obey with mind and heart, setting aside all judgment of one's own, the true spouse of Christ, our holy mother, our infallible and Orthodox mistress, the Catholic Church, whose authority is exercised over us by the hierarchy. Unquote. Another principle laid down by Yolola may cause the reader to gasp. Quote, that we may be altogether of the same mind and in conformity with the Church itself, if she shall have defined anything to be black, which our eyes, in our eyes appears to be white, we ought in like manner to pronounce it to be black, unquote. The total obedience required from those who accept the Constitution and swear the Jesuit oath is such that, <clears throat> quote, they must allow themselves to be born and ruled by divine providence working through their superiors, exactly as if they were a corpse which suffers itself to be born and handled in any way whatsoever, or just an old man's stick which serves him who holds it in his hand wherever and whatever purpose he wishes to use it, unquote. This comes from the documents of the Christian Church, Sir Henry Bentonson, in pages 361 to 363. Such training and discipline and total submission to the order, allied to truthless single-mindedness, have brought worldly dividends in the exercise of absolute power in this century as well as in the last. Now we read about Abraham Lincoln and the Jesuits. 
Former Roman Catholic priest Charles Chinicki, who during the 1860s led almost all the Catholic population of St. Anne, Illinois, to trust in Christ alone, was a friend and confidant of President Abraham Lincoln. In his book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome, he describes his last meeting with Lincoln before the assassination. The president spoke of his present time that God, quote, will call me to him through the hand of an assassin, unquote, and expressed his feelings and revealed a very deep faith. Quote, I see the storm coming, and I know that, this, uh, that his hand is in it. Believe I am ready. I am nothing, but truth is everything. I know right, because I know that this right, for Christ teaches us, and Christ is God. Unquote. He spoke of his impending death. Following news he had just received uh, of the letter of Pope Pius IX to Jefferson Davis in support of the South's case on the Civil War, he knew that the pop uh, publication of this letter was his death warrant. Quote, so many plots have been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they all have failed. When we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of the skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by Jesuits. The Jesuits are so expert in those deeds of blood that Henry IV said that it is impossible to escape them, and he became their victim, though he did all that could be done to protect himself. Escape from the hands, since the letter of the Pope to Jeff Davis has sharpened a million daggers to pierce my breast, would be more than a miracle. But just as the Lord heard no murmur from the lips of Moses, when he told him that he had to die before crossing for the sins of his people. So I hope and pray that he will hear no murmur from me when I fall for my nation's sake. Unquote. President Lincoln was assassinated in Washington on the 14th of April, 1865. Brigadier General Thomas Harris, a member of the military commission that tried to condemn the conspirators found guilty, uh, found guilty of the crime, was convinced of the complicity of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the assassination and its responsibility for it. He wrote that there was, quote, positive evidence that the Jesuit fathers engaged in, pre uh, in preparing young men for the priesthood away out of the village of St. Joseph in far off Minnesota, were in correspondence with their brethren in Washington City and had been informed that the plan to assassinate the president had been matured. The agents, <clears throat> sorry, the agents for its accomplishment had been found, the time for its execution had been set, and so sure were they of this accomplishment that they could announce it as already done three or four hours before it had been consummated, unquote. Now we turn over to the Nazis and the Catholic hierarchy. Hitler and Himmler were greatly influenced by the Jesuits, as was Mussolini, whose father, confessor, was a Jesuit. Dr. J. H. Lehmann points out in his book, Behind the Dictators, and I can advise you to read that book. You can get it online for the moment. Behind the Dictators by J. H. Lehmann. That the Jesuit father Stempfle wrote Mein Kampf for Hitler. Mein Kampf, my struggle. The ghostwriting of Stempfle argues in Mein Kampf in favor of the indisputability of Catholic dogmas and of the intolerant attitude of Catholic education as well as the necessity of blind faith and of the personal infallibility of the Pope. Unquote. Edmund Paris relates in The Vatican Against Europe, also a fantastic book that you can still download on the internet, that Hitler's associate Hermann Rauschning recalled Hitling that he learned most of all from the Jesuit order. Quote, so far there has been nothing more imposing on earth than the hierarchical organization of the Roman Catholic Church. A good part of that organization I have transported to my own party. I will tell you a secret. I am founding an order. Unquote. This is a quote taken from Hitler Madi which will say Hitler told me, from Rauschning, Editions Cooperation, 1939. And when you do your own research, dear listener, you will see that these quotes from Rauschning 
are very, very much attacked on the Internet as being false. Don't let that distract you. Do you know how much the King James Bible is being attacked as being false? And it still is my only true word. So I wouldn't throw that out in the beginning. I would do a little bit more research. And there were times when Rauschning was together with meetings with Hitler, and you can look that up for yourself. But there are a lot of people and a lot of websites out there who say this was just made up. But on the other hand, if you analyze the Third Reich, if you analyze the organization of the NSDAP, the working party Hitler was the leader of, and surely of the SS, you will see that they were structures, structured like, or as an example, like an example of the Jesuits and like the Roman Catholic Church. This cannot be denied. So I'm quite sure that a lot of these quotings from Rauschning are genuine. I just wanted to insert that here a little bit, because, you know, otherwise there will be comments again about, yeah, but that's all a lie. So I'm going to tell you already, I am aware of that, what people on the Internet say about that, but I still have my own opinion on that. And form your own opinion by doing your own research. And I will continue on the bottom of page 86. Hitler was also quoted as saying of Heinrich Himmler, quote, in Himmler I see our Ignatius of Loyola. Walter Schellenberg, like Joseph Goebbels, Jesuit educated, who led the SD or Sicherheitsdienst, uh, the security service of the SS, the uh, BSS, yeah, uh, and was sentenced to death at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, stated that, quote, the SS organization has been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Their regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly, unquote. This comes from the Vatican against Europe from Edmond Paris. Himmler, whose uncle, the Jesuit father Himmler, was the very iron arm of Halke and Ledokowski, and Ledokowski was the general of the order at that time, according to Edmond Paris, quote, belonged to a family that was entirely devoted to the church. His position as supreme chief of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits general, and to the whole structure was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order, unquote. Again, from the Vatican against Europe, from Edmund Perry. The Nazi party was brought to power through the acquaintance, uh, acquaint, oh, sorry, this is a dangerous word for me. <laughs> The Nazi party, was, uh, Nazi party was brought to power through the equations of the Catholic Central Party in Germany and the higher strategy of the Vatican. Instrumental in this strategy were Reich Chancellor Franz von Papen and Papal Nuncio, means Papal Ambassador, Monsignor Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII. Von Papen, owner of the Central Party's official paper Germania, played a leading part in obtaining Hitler his two-thirds majority, signed the law which made Hitler head of state and also was responsible for the enormously important concordat with the Pope in Rome, 1933. That was in July 1933, four months after Hitler came to power. The concordat was his most remarkable achievement and the culmination of his close working with Pacelli and the Vatican. Von Papen declared, quote, the Third Reich is the first power in the world not only to recognize, but to put into practice the lofty principles of the papacy, unquote. And by the way, <clears throat> von Papen escaped the trials of Nuremberg. Pacelli, as Pius XII, became notorious for his silence with regard to Nazi atrocities and von Papen for his success in avoiding responsibility for them. Pius XII is high up on the present Pope's shortlist for canonization and von Papen, who incredibly was acquitted in Nuremberg, okay, <laughs> as I said, was later appointed Papal Chamberlain to Pope John XXIII. 
And another little remark I want to tell here. This concordat signed in July 1933 in Germany between the German state and the Roman Catholic Church is still in working today. It is still active. It hasn't changed a bit. Coming to another part of this part of the book called The Exercise of Power, The Apparatus of Catholic Action. In his book, Memorial of the Captivity of Napoleon at St. Helena, Volume 2, French General Montholon gave his description of the Society of Jesus. Quote, The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time, the greatest and most enormous of abuses. Unquote. Many Protestant watchmen see the Jesuits as just as powerful and active as ever today. Writing in 1965, Avro Manhattan, an authority on Roman Catholicism in politics, described them as, quote, the ecclesiastical stormtroopers of the Catholic Church, unquote, and remarked that, quote, it is most significant that in two traditionally English-speaking Protestant countries, Great Britain and the United States of America, they have their largest contingents, unquote. This comes from Vatican imperialism in the 20th century. Zondervan. Comment? Yeah, please. I also have a little comment on Avro Manhattan, because Avro Manhattan, you have to know, was a knight of Malta. Never forget that when reading his books. But please, Walt, comment. Well, I just want to comment. In other words, if you read that, the last couple of paragraphs and realize what's happening in one month, you know, like when this author, the author wrote this book, he didn't. We weren't that far down the tr the road. So I just, you know, I mean, it, it's yeah. Like I said earlier, he didn't know that the Jesuits were coming in, uh, in in September 2015 to talk to the United States of America. That's right. Yeah. Well, it, it, the thing of it is, I, I we're getting down to a month. And in, in other words, I, I I've been ridiculed for talking about the Jesuits too much and stuff. But it's so much in our face right now that you cannot deny who is controlling America. It's the Jesuit order. Through Jesuit Georgetown University, through the Jesuit-founded Council on Foreign Relations, through the Knight of Malta-founded Trilateral Commission. Yes. Absolutely. Six, Absolutely. Out of the, six out of the nine chief justices are Catholic, and I just found this out this last couple of weeks. The, uh, the other three of the three are Council on Foreign Relations. So, they are. Yes. So, in other words, the the uh, the you know the Supreme Court is solidly it's it's Catholic through and through. And and to prove it, to prove it, they they pass same they pass sodomy. They pass the sodomy law of same sex marriage all over the United States. Yes. Who did they it? are everywhere. And who did it? It wasn't the, it wasn't the Puritans. It wasn't the Protestants. There's not one Protestant in there. The Catholics passed sodomy. Because they love it. Because that's, that's the heart of it. That's true. Okay, I'm just reading the last paragraph, and then we'll close the broadcast for today, Walt. Jesuits occupy posts at the highest levels uh, of influence in government, although they are not easily identified. One example, Vernon Walters was a roving ambassador for successive United States administrations and top-level negotiator for the White House for many years. In Washington, he has steered a careful path avoiding calls to power and concentrating on the serving men at the very top. He was educated at Stonyhurst College and at French Jesuit schools and was described by former Secretary of State Alexander Haig as, quote, like a member of the clergy in terms of his lifestyle, unquote. 
Vernon Walter's most recent assignment has been as ambassador to Germany, leading up to the reunification and beyond. And with this, I will close down the reading for today, and we will continue next week on Hour of the Truth and our broadcast on reading uh, on this wonderful chapter of the Jesuit, global conspir- uh, Jesuit Vatican Global Conspiracy, Chapter 12, The Jesuits Today. Walt, do you have any closing remarks? No, except, you know, the offer still, if, if, if you'll send an email to feedback at granddesignexposed.com, I'll send you a free book. I'll send you this Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And the more I, I, you know, I just put this together. I didn't write this book, but these are the key pieces of the puzzle. You won't, and after, when you digest what's in this little book of a hundred, of of a hundred and, what is it, 136 pages, you'll understand that there's no speculation anymore. I mean, I, I, I'm losing a little patience, you know, as, and, and I, and that's, that's part of it. You have to be patient because the, the evidence is so over, overwhelming now that who controls the world? And it's the Jesuits. The New World Order is not, if it's coming, it's here. If you have ears to hear and eyes to see, open them. Open them to the Word of God. Read, first and for all, the King James Bible for full understanding. And then you will see, and your eyes will be opened, and you will see the world with totally different eyes. Thank you very much for your contribution, Walt, to the broadcast today. Thank you very much, everybody who was in the chat room for listening live, and thank you, everyone else, for listening to the video I will make later on from this broadcast. And until next time, next week, God bless you all. Thank you, and bye-bye.